my discussions on uh, can somebody get me some chalk um, on set theory today and on the other color is oh that's white okay. all right uh, so that's the idea i will quickly discuss a uh, little bit about axiom of choice and then uh, very intuitively about transfinite induction and uh, that will complete our discussion on set theory then i will get into the real number system okay uh, so recall last time we proved the well ordering theorem which gave us an assurance that given any non empty set x there is some ordering which will be a well ordering on that set so for every non empty set x there exists a partial order on x such that this becomes a well ordered set that is the ordering is a well ordering okay uh, the idea was we looked at all the possible uh, the, what was the idea uh, the first step we looked at all possible uh, well ordered sets with carrier set in x then uh, we introduce the partial order which we denoted by this on wx which is the continuation partial order and then we showed that every chain in this partial ordered set is bounded above then we used zones lemma to show that zones lemma implies there exists a maximal element now any maximal any any element here is a well ordered set so it's a well ordered set in wx and finally we showed that this carrier set for this maximal element must be indeed equal to the whole set so therefore uh, x therefore x not is a well ordered set so the order the, the carrier set for the maximal element is x and the corresponding order partial order gives us the well ordering of this this is an existence theorem if you ask me what it is it's not that easy in many times we it's more an existence theorem as more than enough for us to prove certain things okay now if we grant the uh, well ordering theorem then we can prove what is known as the axiom of choice okay so that's what my next topic will be very briefly i look at the axiom of choice okay. so as i as i said last time i have two sets a a1 a2 both are non empty take two non empty sets Okay, so then we have the Cartesian product, which we define as a i belongs to a. The set of all ordered pairs a one, a two, where a one belongs to a one and a two belongs to a two. So that's the Cartesian product of two non-empty sets I have taken. Then I am going to define. look at also uh, let me call i as the set 1 2 okay 
the index set for these uh, sets, okay. I as the set 1, 2 and A at the set A1 union A2, okay. So, I take I to be the, the index set 1 and 2 and uh, script A to be the union of A1 and A2 and I use the following notation F superscript C I A. Well, without this, we meant functions from I to A. Now that C stands for choice functions from A to A. So, this is the set of all functions from I to A, I to script A, such that they are special type, choice. What is the choice? f of 1, f of i must belong to a i, f 1 must belong to a 1, f 2 must belong to a 2. Then such a function is called a choice function on the collection of the sets a 1, a 2. Okay. Now you see these two are essentially same written in two different languages. If you have an ordered pair that gives a choice function with f1 as a1 and f2 as a2 and if you have a choice function it gives an element of the ordered pair okay so that is the dangerous word clearly uh, a1 cross a2 is the same as can be interpreted as the same as fc i So, every ordered uh, pair uh, gave us uh, this type of uh, ordered pair gave us a function like this and every function like this gives us an ordered pair like that. So, now we use this identification uh, to interpret Cartesian product as a collection of functions, okay. And that we use for a general collection of sets which is not necessarily a finite collection, may not be a countably infinite collection of uh, sets, but even an uncountably infinite collection of sets. So, the generalization is the following. So, let A alpha alpha belonging to some index at i, b a non-empty collection of non-empty sets. Non-empty collection of non-empty sets. What is meant by non-empty collection? This index set at least has one element. So, there is at least one set and the sets are all non uh, remark I may be finite or countably infinite or uncountably infinite. So, it can have any cardinality. not necessarily finite number of sets, it could be uncountably infinite number of sets, a sequence of sets or an uncountable number of sets. It can be any collection of sets. Then we define the Cartesian product. Then we define the Cartesian product of this collection of sets. That collection A alpha of sets, we are going to look at the Cartesian product of all these sets which we and denoted by Cartesian product alpha belong to I of all the A alphas. That is the notation we will use. Cartesian product of all the A alphas alpha belonging to the 
index set as how do I define so I use that function notation as Cartesian product of this is the set of all choice functions from i to a where a is the union of all these sets. It is exactly copying what we did for two sets. In the case of two sets, we took A to be the union and the size function to be mapping from the index set to the union such that the f of alpha will be equal to will be in A alpha. This notation is, is a function from I to A so that f of alpha belongs to A alpha. Okay. Now, it may look crazy. But you cannot prove whether a priori it is not clear whether there is anything in this Cartesian product at all, whether there is any such function at all, whether any such choice function exists. And that is what the axiom of choice is. It says this Cartesian product is non-empty. That means there exists such a choice function. It may look crazy, it is obvious, you just pick one fellow from each set. And I got it, okay. So, but that pick part is not clear from the remaining uh, parts of the set theory axiom, okay. So, it may look very, very crazy, the axiom of choice. Most people feel it crazy, uh, but many times uh, the people who think crazy are the real crazy people. Uh, because they have not understood the subtlety of the non-crazy person, okay. The axiom of choice says for any non-empty collection of non-empty sets, the Cartesian product is non-empty. It seems to be a lot of non-empty statements. At the end, looks like a very empty statement. Okay. And a non-empty collection of non-empty sets, the Cartesian product is non-empty. That is, there exists a choice function. That's why it's called axiom of choice. Choice. I pick one representative from each one of those sets. I can pick one representative from each one of those sets. Oh. Okay. Now, I will use well-ordering theorem to prove that this is true. And look, therefore, why the hell it is called axiom? Okay. So, we shall, we shall use well-ordering theorem to prove axiom of choice. So, I put in inverted commas prove. See, it is like uh, cheating. Okay. They make it look like a proof, but essentially eventually it will all be cheating. Okay. No, 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 not cheating in a sense. Cheating in the sense that uh, eventually, you will say, if I want to prove a well ordering theorem, I need axiom of choice. Okay, that's the level we will reach. I will make that statement in the end. So, just to indicate how it works, we have a collection of sets A alpha. So, we are given A alpha, alpha belonging to some index set non-empty collection of non-empty sets. We want to get a choice function. So, we want to show, get an F mapping I to union alpha A alpha such that F of alpha belongs to 
the alpha. This is what is meant by a choice function. We want to get one such function. There exists such a function. Now use the well ordering theorem. What we do is let us look at A. Now the A alphas are non empty, therefore the script A will be non empty. So clearly, therefore, A is non empty. A is non empty. Now, whenever you have a non empty set, the well ordering theorem says there is an order on it which makes it a well ordered set. So, there exists therefore by well ordering theorem, I will write it simply as WOT by the well ordering theorem, there exists a partial order on A such that this is a well ordered set. Okay. Let it exist a partial order like that, that becomes a well order. That is what the well ordering theorem says. Given any non empty set, there is something somewhere, some order which puts things in a proper uh, well ordered set. Okay. In every non empty set will have a first element. That is what it meant by well ordered set. Now, therefore, we have A with this partial order is a well ordered set. We have this is a well ordered set now what is meant by a well ordered set every non empty subset must have a first element so therefore hence every sub set has a first element what is a sub set take a non empty subset and put the same order onto that and then that becomes a sub set so take any subset with this order if it has to be poset it has to be non empty so take any non empty subset put this order on it that will have a first element so in particular hence since a alpha is part of capital a and that's non empty that's given to us because all these sets are non empty sets so a alpha is a non empty subset of a therefore a alpha is a sub poset of A and therefore A alpha has a first element say F alpha. Now we are done. The mapping that you want is map alpha to F alpha. Okay, so now define define f i to union i alpha alpha and i as f of alpha the terminology may be very terrible let me call it as some other uh, i think it's very clear f of alpha is equal to f of alpha belongs to here. therefore f is a choice function So, the, what does this choice function do? It just picks the first element from each one of these sub posets. That is all. It just picks the first element. That the existence of the first element is given by the well ordering theorem, and therefore the existence of the value of this function at every point is well defined, and therefore this choice function is well defined, and I have a choice function, and that is what the axiom of choice is. Okay. So, that is a, a brief indication of how the axiom of choice 
follows from the well ordering theorem. So, let us now recall uh, many of the things that we have done. Okay. Some of the things we have proved, some of the things we have not proved, etc. We had John's lemma, which we did not prove, right? And then we had two keys lemma, which we got from here. So that fellow implied this. So, in a sense, if you had John's lemma, Two keys lemma was there. From two keys lemma, we proved Hausdorff maximality principle. And we also proved from Zorn's lemma the well ordering theorem. And from the well ordering theorem, we proved axiom of choice. Right. So, at least uh, forget about this part. At least in this part, if we see, if we had John's lemma, then you have axiom of choice. From John's lemma, you get well ordering theorem. From well ordering theorem, you get axiom of choice. So, it is like, okay, I have John, I had to only prove John's lemma. Then this axiom of choice is an unnecessary axiom. But then, in order to prove John's lemma, we need axiom. So, it goes in circles. Okay. So, in fact, what we have is the following theorem, which is, uh, uh, which I am not going to prove in right now, I mean at any moment for that. I will just give the following theorem that if I call this 1, this as 2, this as 3, this as 4 and this as 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, are all equivalent. Whereas if one of them is true, all of them are true, but we do not even know which one is true. Because if I want to prove this, I want that, but I do not know that. If I want to okay, assume that is true, then another fellow has to be proved. So it goes in cycles, and uh, therefore uh, one of them must be added as an axiom, then all of them are theorems. And the axiom of choice seems to be the most intuitive of all of them. It looks like very convincing. Say, what is the big deal? I have a set of say, pick one fellow from each set. You are making a big fuss about it. So I add that as a, anything that looks almost very convincingly trivial is an axiom. But what meets the eye uh, is not uh, necessarily uh, true. So one has to put it as an axiom. So, the axiom of choice is added as a set in set theory as an axiom and the rest of them become a theorem then. John's lemma is a theorem, Hausdorff maximality principle is a theorem, well ordering theorem is a theorem and so on. But though I took the other way around, I proved axiom of choice using well ordering theorem. But eventually the, uh, the positioning is axiom of choice is treated as an axiom and all the others are results. Okay. But without the axiom of choice, others do not come into the picture at all everything just disappears, we do not have anything. If you say, I do not, I have set theory, I am going to work with set theory in which I am not going to allow axiom of choice, then all these are not available for you. No Zorn's lemma, no well ordering theorem, no house stop, no two key, nothing. Better to have all these things. So, we add axiom of choice. Okay. So, that is the brief, uh, quick uh, thing about axiom of choice. But this is the uh, most uh, fundamental theorem to show that everything is dependent on the other. So, you have to add uh, this as the axiom. Okay. I think some of the things I have proved in this one, this imply, this imply, that imply, this imply. So, somewhere along the line you complete the cycle, you will get all the results. Okay. Now, uh, just to uh, uh, wind up set theory uh, preliminaries, I am going to very intuitively tell you about something called transfinite induction. Okay. 
because everything has been very intuitive only. Uh, I think uh, it is always better as a first level, second level, third level, fourth level. You reach a theory at a more naive level and intuitive level than a very formal level. It becomes very difficult, extremely uh, difficult. Uh, I remember I had a friend, more a friend, a colleague uh, in the US, who used to be a great set theory and logic man. And uh, when I was visiting, he was, I used to spend uh, every day an hour discussing with him about the various things in set theory and learn a lot of things from him. I used to tell you, are the only guy who talked to me. The rest of the guys think I am crazy. Okay. Well, I said, maybe they are now start thinking I am also crazy, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, so, it is a very interesting subject, but uh, you have to devote a lot of time uh, to really get into the uh, nitty gritties of every detail of all the nuances involved in that. Okay. Oh. Right. So, I said, I will do something about transfinite induction. Again, as I said, this I uh, make a very intuitive uh, uh, introduction to transfinite induction. You would have all seen a mathematical induction in uh, somewhere or the other. Of course, I saw it uh, in postgraduate, probably the next graduate generation saw it in BSc, and probably a few years later it came to PUC or something like that. And probably now a fourth grade or fifth grade student talks about pianos, axioms and uh, uh, things like that. So, it does not matter. But some form or the other, we would have seen uh, mathematical induction. What is mathematical induction? Can someone tell me what mathematical induction is? Forget about mathematical, maybe that scares you. What is induction? Then you don't talk about electrical engineering and talk about induction, coil and things like that. Well, the, basically you, that's the idea, it moves from one to the other, okay. So, the idea was, so let's say, I remember one of the earliest uh, things we proved uh, in uh, college, uh, when, I, when I joined college, I think, uh, in uh, mathematical induction was that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus etc. n is equal to n into n plus 1 by 2. Then 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square plus n square is n into n plus 1 into 2 n plus 1 by 6. Another mathematical induction proof. Then 1 cube plus 2 cube plus 3 cube plus n cube is equal to n square into n plus 1 whole square by 4 or some such thing. Every one of these we proved by induction. What did we mean by we proved it by induction? How, does, how did the induction proof go? Yeah. Okay, so let's see, let's see the, the, what he said, right, okay, so the idea was the following. Let me first uh, even write the way uh, we do it. So, I have a sequence of statements, Sn, n equal to 1, 2, etc., is a sequence of statements. This is how we were taught, okay. We are usually introduced to usage of mathematical induction. This is how we are introduced, okay. I have a sequence of statement that is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus n is equal to n into n plus 1 by 2. That statement for n equal to 1, n equal to 2, n equal to 3, n equal to 4, that is the sequence of statements. The sum of the first n numbers is equal to n into n plus 1 by 2. Now, that is a sequence of statement valid, uh, we want to prove it is valid for n equal to 1, n equal to 2, n equal to 3 and so on and so forth. Now, let us say T is the set of all n for which Sn is true. For all you know, somebody might have said 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus n is equal to some some other fn instead of n into n plus 1 by 2. Now, it may not be true for some n, it may be true for some other n and so on and so forth. So, I just look at the values of n for which that statement is true, 
okay the uh, truth table or truth values for this now if you want to prove how did you prove if you wanted if you wanted to show that t is all of m that is, is true for all m the set of values for which it is true is all of m we we said one one belongs to t that is the statement is true for m equal to <coughs> 1 and 2 <coughs> if k belongs to t implies k plus 1 belongs to t and from this we, we said that if this is true this would automatically imply it is true for all n that is what the mathematical induction is ok. So, what the mathematical induction said was all nothing to do about statements being true or anything like that. If a subset T of M is has that 1 belongs to T and whenever K belongs to T, K plus 1 also belongs to T, then that subset must be all of M. So, that is what mathematical induction was. So, what, what would you say? If T is a subset of T belongs to M, is such that I will write it again 1 belongs to T and K belongs to T implies K plus 1 belongs to T then T must be all of them. This is what this is exactly the idea that we use in proving in using mathematical induction. This is what we call as mathematical induction. Now we want to generalize this. See, M is a well ordered set with the partial order less than or equal to. Okay. So, therefore, it is a statement in a well ordered set. Okay. That statement has to be the essence of the statement has to be carefully extracted to get a general result for a well ordered set. And when you extract that and restate this mathematical induction in a general well ordered state, you get what is known as a transfinite induction. So, now what I will do is we want to generalize this. Now, in place of n, I will take a well ordered set. Any? well ordered set. Now, this mathematical induction also stated in another form, the second version of mathematical induction. What is that? Instead of stating this way, they say that 1, 2, k minus 1 belongs to T implies k belongs to Okay, the numbers 1, 2, 3, k minus 1 belong to T implies k also belongs to T. That is another way of stating the mathematical induction. That is another way we use it also. Okay, both are same. Okay. So, now I am going to use this idea. What is the 1, 2, k minus 1? I want to extract that. Okay, so this I can write this set for example, I can write the set of all x in n so that x is less than or equal to k x not equal to k less than or equal to the partial order. So, I am going to look at all those elements which strictly precede k strictly precede k they are not equal to k. Now, that I will call as an initial segment defined by or subordinate to k. So, I will copy that here. If A belongs to W, we define IA to be the set of all X belonging to W such that X strictly precedes A. X is related to A, but X is not equal to A. So, all those elements which are different from A 
and which are related to A. So, those are the fellows who strictly precede A. And that is called the initial segment subordinate to A. So, therefore, I can write this set as in this partial ordered set, this as I n, I k. Okay. This set I can write it as I k. All those fellows who are subordinate to k. Now, what that segment says is if all that set, that initial segment subordinate to k belongs to T, then k also belongs to so that is what we will define. So that is what uh, the, so the, the corresponding theorem is question is this true? That is if T in W is such that uh, IA belongs to T implies A belongs to T. Does this imply T is equal to the whole set? So clear. So W is replaced by N, uh, N is replaced by W, T is replaced by that statement that whenever an initial segment belongs, then that subordinate that, that fellow who defines that initial segment also belongs, then the whole set must be equal to then T must be equal to the whole set. And that fact this is true, and that is called transfinite index. So, the transfinite index is stated as follows. Let W be a well ordered set. T belongs to W. IA belongs to w, T implies A belongs to T. That implies T belongs to W such that this implies T is equal to W. Whenever an initial segment belongs, then that cutoff point also belongs to W. Then that set is the whole set. That is what the transfinite induction, which is essentially this generalized to a well ordered set. Instead of just the well ordered set n less than or equal to, put it in proper language for any well ordered set, you get the uh, transfinite index. Let me uh, indicate a proof of it. So, we are given this, this is given, we want to prove this, okay. So, this is to be, this is to prove and that is given, okay. Given such that, given that whenever an initial segment belongs to T, then that A that defines that initial segment also belongs to T, then that T must be the then we want to conclude that T must be the whole set. It allows you to go up to this I have come, says if you have come up to this, you can take the next step. What is after all A? A is the first element of the complement of what? Complement of I A. It is a complex, if we take the complement of I A, it starts with A. So, if you have gone all the way up to I A, then you go to the next first step in the remaining. That allows you, now you have come, you can go to the first step in the remaining and then sweep out the whole of it. That is uh, in a uh, continuous manner also. So, how do I prove that? I want to prove, to prove that T is equal to W. This is given. We want to prove that T is equal to W. Suppose not. The great gambit. Okay. So, we have W here and T is part of it. 
strictly part of it. So, suppose not, then T is strictly contained in W because we see T is a subset of W. Now, T is not equal to W, so T must be a strict subset of W. So, if it is a strict subset of W, then W minus T, this portion, W minus T is a non-empty subset of the partial ordered set. Now, whenever you have a non-empty subset, it must have a first element. Okay. So, therefore, W minus T has a first element. Let us call it as F. W minus T as the first element F, say F. Now, where is F? F is outside T. F is the first element of W minus T. So, it does not have anything to do with T. So, now what is the initial segment subordinate to F? The initial segment subordinate to F is all those elements in W such that X strictly precedes F and not equal to X strictly precedes F. Okay. Is that clear? So, the initial segment generated by F or initial segment subordinate to F is all those elements X which are not equal to F and which precede F. Now, if you take any element here, all of them succeed F because F is the first element of W minus T. So, none of these fellows is in that IF. None of the elements of W minus T can go to IF because every element of W minus T is either F or come after F. So, note if X belongs to W minus T, then either X equal to F or F is strictly less than X. So, therefore, no element of W minus T is in IF, the initial segment subordinate to F. So, therefore, that initial segment has nothing to do with this part, it is all in T. So, therefore, IF is definitely fully in T because no part of IF is in, nobody in IF comes from W minus T. Now, if IF is contained in T, hypothesis says F must belong to T. So, therefore, by star, F must belong to T, which is a contradiction because F was chosen from outside T, which is a contradiction. Therefore, our gambit was worth taking. This is false. And therefore, W equal to T. Okay. So, that is just the uh, simple uh, idea that one hour you have initial segment uh, subordinate to A belongs to T. Then if that implies A also belongs to T, then only way is T is the whole set. So, that is what is known as transfinite induction, which allows you to take steps forward even in a continuum, not necessarily a discrete step okay, like the integer. So, if you interpret mathematical induction in the right language, it gives you the uh, general transfinite induction. Okay. So, that will be uh, the, for the time being uh, the last idea that I would discuss in set theory. Okay. Whenever it's, I, I will use many more other things and whenever uh, needed, I will pull them. Okay. So, now starts real analysis. Okay. Uh, 
So, for to start real analysis, first we will talk about what is real. Okay, so what is the real? So, the next chapter will be on real numbers. Okay, so I will begin this discussion. This is the next chapter. Real numbers system. So, you see, uh, there is a very famous uh, statement uh, which I keep repeating every now and then. I think it is due to uh, Kronecker, Leopold Kronecker, said God gave us the integers and all else is man's work. Okay, so what he meant was once the integers were there, we didn't know how to, where these came from. So, it is in some form, it is an axiom that there are integers. That's what is known as Peano's axiom, which is also equivalent to the induction. Okay. So, Peano's axiom were the one that gave us the integers. So, he said, God gave us integers. The rest of it, don't tell me God gave, I created. What does he mean? Once you have integer, I will create all the way up to the real numbers and then the complex numbers and whatever you want, okay, beyond that also. So, therefore, we have to see this construction, how these real numbers are constructed. So, I will do, I will skip a few steps to start with and modify a Kronecker statement and said that by before entering, God gave me the rational numbers. We all know what is a rational number, at least we all Somehow or the other it has been drilled into our mind that we know real, rational numbers. In fact, we have been drilled in our mind that we also know real numbers. Okay. So, let us say we all know rational number. What is rational number? M by N. What is M and N? Integers. What are integers? I do not know. 1, 2, 3. What is 1, 2, 3? That is a problem. Okay. So, therefore, let us say all that questions have been answered, we know what are rational numbers. So, starting from rational numbers, how do we go to construct real numbers? Now, if you look at the construction of the real numbers or any number system, starting from the integers, uh, starting from the natural numbers, the so called natural numbers, the number cell term is built upon. Okay. At each stage, the building process is the whole thing is constructed to, to remove a certain defect in what you have. The positive integers have a defect, you added 0, okay, and then there was a defect, we could not solve the equations like x plus 4 is equal to 3, the balance sheet we did not know how to maintain, so we had to in introduce negative integers. So, the natural numbers became bigger and became the set of all integers. How that is done? We will see later. Then from the integers, then we said, okay, I had the integers, I could not solve the equation like 3x equal to 4. Partitioning was difficult, properties and uh, cash. And so, we had to introduce numbers like 3 by 4, 4 by 3 and all, whatever they mean. So, we introduced uh, another defect was removed from the number system and the rational numbers were constructed. And when each time a new number system was constructed, the old one was not lost. When we had positive integers and we built negative integers, this uh, all the integers, the positive integers are part of all the integers. When then we constructed rational numbers, the integers were part of the rational numbers. Now, we will remove certain defects in the rational numbers, which was a telling blow for uh, the Pythagoreans uh, who believed that any number, any two uh, geometric objects, uh, lines are proportional, or proportional, they worked on proportionality and they found that their own Pythagoras theorem, the hypotenuse with uh, of a right angle triangle whose sides were one each which was square root of dot 2 was not expressible in the form m by n. So, that was not proportional to any or proportion of two uh, integers. 
So there was a defect within the rational number system. So we had to remove them. Of course, there we can introduce algebraic numbers and so on and so forth. So I am going to right away go from rational numbers to real numbers. So we have these numbers 1, 2, 3, n. This is what from n the construction went to let us say z which is 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 etc. The from that the q was constructed. Let me write it in the form uh, we all know m by n, mn belong to z, n not equal to 0. And then from q we went to this real numbers. Now, it is this part I will discuss now. That is, God gave us the rational numbers, or God, along with those all brilliant minds, gave us the uh, rational numbers with the integers and the rational numbers. So, we all start with the rational numbers. From the rational numbers, how does, how does, how did uh, one look at the uh, real number? There are many ways this was done, and uh, Koshi was one of them. Cauchy's, the, the way of looking through Cauchy sequences was one and then Dedekind had another way of looking at it called the Dedek, through what are known as Dedekind cuts and of course Cantor was a great guy, he said I do not need all these things, I will construct myself the integers and from then I will construct all the other things. So there are various ways of doing these things. I will begin with Cauchy, okay, the uh, indicate how Cauchy sequences are used, okay. So to start with, so I, this is, this is given to us, the rational numbers, I have them, okay. Then, now it is given means now any statement I make should not involve anything other than the rational numbers because that is the only world that we, that has been created so far. So every statement I will make, whatever numbers I say, they are all only rational numbers. So, so suppose Rn is a sequence of rational numbers, sequence of that is R1, R2, R3, etc. is a sequence of rational numbers. And R is another rational number. So I have a sequence of rational numbers and I have a rational number, then we say that Rn converges to R definition. Rn converges to R if it gets closer and closer to R, whatever that means. How close? You tell me how close. So you tell me your tolerance limit, then I will make Rn go to R within that tolerance limit by taking n large enough. So first given is the tolerance limit. Given epsilon, that has to be a rational number because I can calculate, all calculations are rational numbers. Epsilon in Q, epsilon greater than 0. We know what is meant by order among the rational numbers. So, everything about rational numbers is known. Given a positive rational number, there exists a positive integer which depends on n such that if you go and look beyond that stage, the tolerance limit would have been achieved. R n and R will be within that tolerance limit. You tell the tolerance limit, I will tell you where you have to go and see, then your tolerance limit would have been achieved. If that is possible for every tolerance limit, then we say Rn converges to R. It is like playing a game. I have the sequence Rn, that number is R. You play the epsilon card, I play the n epsilon card, then you go and see beyond that n epsilon and compare Rn and R. Yeah, good, that is less than epsilon. Then I won the game, 
that is i have converted if i if i am not able to play a card for your epsilon i am not able to play means there just does not exist such a card for a particular epsilon then there is no convergence so it must happen for every epsilon card there is an n epsilon card such that that tolerance limit is achieved beyond that card level then we say rn converges to r in q all this is in q okay everything is in the world of q is that clear now all the properties of limits hold let me i'll do the details next class let me just say all the properties of the limits hold what are the properties superpositions hold if i have 10 sequences this fellow converts to r1 this fellow converts to r2 this fellow converts to r10 then you take any superposition that will convert to corresponding superposition of the limits okay so if rn converges to r sn converges to s alpha rn plus beta sn converges to alpha r plus beta s what are alpha and beta they also have to be rational so everything rational superpositions nothing we don't we are not at create at the world of real so we don't know it okay so everything is rational and similarly if you multiply this sequence term this sequence term this sequence term this sequence the limit will be that into that into that so these properties are all easily maintained so superpositions are maintained products are product of the limit to the limit of the product but all these have a defect in the sense this definition says suppose i give the sequence how do i know whether it converges or not for that i should know r suppose there is no r and that's what happened with the square root of 2 1.4 1.41 1.414 if you go on taking that sequence there is no r so how am i going to check even the so therefore kashi said this could be looked at it in a different manner convergence you don't look at it that way you say that if you have a sequence we say it's a cauchy sequence we he didn't say it's a cauchy sequence he probably used a very clever word c sequence he would have called it so we are hoping that somebody someday somebody call it cauchy sequence okay uh, there is something called banach space okay banach was very clever he didn't call it banach space he called it b space okay in you someday that will be expanded to banach he is very clever guy anyway uh, uh, really clever mathematically clever not uh, this way cunning okay so therefore cauchy said a sequence is said to be of a particular type which we will call it as cauchy sequence if something happens okay. then he said not all cauchy sequence converge there is a problem then what he did was he took all the cauchy sequences all possible cauchy sequences of rational numbers and then he introduced a equivalence relation what is an equivalence the equivalence relation was this sequence is essentially the same as this sequence but the difference goes to zero he says that i will say the sequence rn is equivalent to the sequence sn if rn minus sn converges to zero okay so now i will tell you the limit now you check rn minus sn goes rn minus sn goes to zero means the difference can be made as small as possible because r is zero now here in place of rn i have rn minus s the difference can be made as small as possible so introduce that is that becomes an equivalence relation so he, he introduce a equivalence relation so how does the sequence of arguments go which i will uh, do in detail so i have this then i define cauchy sequence of rational numbers then what he did was he looked at collection of all such cauchy collection of all cauchy sequences of rational numbers and then in this he defined an equivalence relation and the moment you have an equivalence relation you have a partition 
what are the parts of that partition the equivalence classes and each equivalence class is called a real number is called a new number each equivalence class is called a new number and now i get a new number system and that's called a real number system and of course i mentioned that whenever you construct a new number system you should not lose the old one now the old one we started with this q so he has to somehow identify within this equivalence classes this rationals also are sitting there somehow okay so make that identification first so and he said there are more fellows in it than there are in q so he created a bigger number system and now you have to introduce the arithmetic there now i could add rational numbers what do you mean by addition in this new system now in i have rational numbers i have addition i have this new system i have addition in this new system rationals have been sitting there so there is addition of rational numbers in this new system and there is addition of rational number in the old system is there any difference that should if there is any difference you have made a mess of the whole thing but luckily it is not the way it is done is very cleverly done nothing old is lost more new things are created and that's the way the whole uh, real number system was constructed by koshi okay. that is one of the uh, nice uh, easy but there are lots of things that one has to take care of okay many subtle uh, idea things have to be proved and settled and things like that and everything so the way to do it is from the rational numbers you can set all cauchy sequences and then look at the equivalence relation and then look at the equivalence class generated by this equivalence relation and that equivalence class is uh, the collection of these distinct equivalence classes is your new set of numbers and that's called the real numbers and the rational numbers can be embedded into this new system without losing the arithmetic in the new system that's the way the real numbers are constructed from the rational numbers uh, what i'll do is i will indicate uh, many of the steps how it is done but without probably a proof but i'll say what is to be proved you think about how one can or what are the things gaps that are to be filled in order at each step in order to go through that we have done okay uh, the same way at each step there is an equivalence class involved when you are going from uh, positive integers to the set of all integers there is an equivalence relation to introduce and then an equivalence class the new equivalence class is the new numbers then from the integer to the rational number again we introduce an equivalence uh, relation again we have an equivalence uh, class again we have a partition again we have a new equivalence class again you have a new number at every stage there is a equivalence relation that comes into the picture in order to bring in new set of numbers so this idea of equivalence relation and the partition that comes out of the equivalence relation is a very important idea okay that is uh, typically built in to this whole number system creation of course from r we can go to a c but i will go only up to r the real number system so that will be the next chapter first construction of the real numbers and the various uh, notions involved in that i will also indicate how dedicated approach this okay the sort of intuitive geometric in a sense uh, it is sort of uh, uh, what i would say will be more liked by euclid uh, than uh, the cauchy type that uh, euclid might have would have like dedicates way of looking at it better okay those the euclidean fellows would like that okay it is like filling gaps like you go to your dentist he fills all the gaps charges you a lot and uh, and that's what uh, dedicate did uh, so there are gaps i will fill the gaps how do i fill the gap i will tell you the process of filling the gap that is the dedicates construction of the real numbers he called them dedicate cuts okay so that is another way of looking at the real number 
All of them are equal, and that's another one. We have to say the Dedekind construction can be identified with the Cauchy construction, the Cauchy construction can be identified, the not only the numbers identified, the arithmetic is identified, everything is identified. So any one of these systems can be taken as representative of the uh, real numbers. Okay. So the next chapter will deal with all these things. Okay.